no fours, no four itches, no wilds, I don't it rate on tests. Why? Because zero, one or many, it's all that I need to think about. What we have here, we have here two projects. One is basically the code that will be under test. The other one is for our test, just to show you what happens when you write the loops or how you can write the same test without a loop. First, let me show you the code under test. We have here really simple scenarios just to show you how people tend to write tests using force, whiles for itches, and I will show you based on this scenario how can we rewrite the test to avoid it. And on this case, what we have is basically an order object that has a list of lines. This is not production code. So on this case, the order lines have some functions that you can use to get data from those lines. And it's those functions that we'll be checking. So the typical use case is when you are writing tests to test something, but to test that thing, first you need to prepare a collection because the results will be based on that collection. So on your arrange step, you will be manipulating a list, filling that list with data uh, in order to test your methods. On this case, what do I have? I have a simple collection here, the list of order lines. What is an order line? Let me show you. An order line is a simple object with a name and an amount. And based on this, what I want is to have two functions. One that will return the most expensive item on this order, and the other one will return the cheapest one on the same order. Let me show you the tests now. On the tests, I have here two simple use cases just to show you how typically people tend to write those kind of tests. So on this case, what I'm doing, I'm creating an order, I'm iterating through a list of numbers, so from one to 10, and then I'm filling in the order lines with a new order item with a given name, and the amount is the same as the index of the iteration. And then I will basically assert that, okay, if I'm running from one to 10, the most expensive item should be a 10. Or on the other side, when I'm trying to get the cheapest one, I will do exactly the same, and by the end, I will call the cheapest one, and the amount should be one, because I'm starting with i equals to one. If we run these tests, we will see that they succeed. Nothing wrong about that. If we run striker.net, we will see that the tests are in fact in a good shape. If you don't know striker.net, it's an amazing mutation tool for .NET, and I will link a video by Nick Shapses on the description that covers really well what Striker can do. So let me run Striker for you. Results are back. And as you can see, the final mutation score is 100%. What does that mean? It means that the tests are doing exactly what they are meant to be. So there's no way that something has escaped from me on these tests. So they are good. If they are good, why do I avoid writing them? Let me just duplicate one of these tests just to show you side by side the difference when you write the for and when you don't write it. Before I start rewriting this test, what do you need to know? You need to know that in this type of tests that are touching collections, in fact, you just need to test three cases. One is the zero, the other one is the one, and the other one is the two, because two, in fact, count as many for the scenarios that you'll be using that collection. So instead of using a given 10, I will do a given two, okay? Obviously, I could do something like this, but I would win anything by this refactoring. But in fact, what I prefer to do is doing something as simple as this. Since I only have two, now I can do something as simple as this. I rewrite my tests to have twice the add line and I will add here the numbers that I want, okay? One and two, for example. So on this case, I should expect a 10. If I want to test with a 10, I can just write here 10, no problem. Let me run the test just to show you that they both are green. So the tests are green, there's no mistake here. And what I want you to notice is that, in fact, this test may be more descriptive than this one. And the cognitive load required to understand this code is quite high when compared to this one. And this is a small example, as you can see. When you are writing tests, you should aim for a symptomatic complexity of one. So doing for each is, ifs, else's, those kind of things should be avoided. As you can see, it's pretty clear what is inside of this collection when I have this result. Now you may be questioning, but is this doing exactly the same thing? Let me show you. Let's just comment this first test, duplicate the other one for the cheapest one and apply the same recipe. I converted the four into calls into the headlines. 
Okay, and as you can see, I have these two tests and the other ones are commented. Let's run .NET Striker once again. Results are back. And as you can see, it's still 100%. Okay, what does that mean? Is that with a code that is simpler than the other one, I achieved exactly the same result. This test seems cleaner, simple, and I don't need a lot of time to understand what it is doing. Next time that you write a for, a while, or a for each inside of your test code, just stop and think about it. Try this approach with two entries to see if it's achieving exactly the same results. This is a good way to remove the friction and reduce the cognitive load of your test code. Another way to do that is avoiding to take the dry principle too far. And if you want to know more about that, make sure to watch this video. I will see you soon and in the meanwhile, just keep it simple.